Hello and welcome to another video that's going to show you really clearly how to get the top grades. It's an essay from a wonderful viewer called Lissy who has sent in this grade 8 essay and she got two grade 8s in the 2019 exams. It's on A Christmas Carol but it will still work whatever text that you're studying. So I'm going to use it to show you how to write a three-part thesis where you set out your perspective on the writer's purpose in this case it will be Dickens the top of the mark scheme is divided into seven sections really there are seven skills and I'll show you how Lissy hits all of these skills during the course of this very short 500 word essay so every time there's something in bold this will be something I'm teaching you about and then look out for the parts in yellow because that's where I'll explain she could have gained full marks, 30 out of 30, 100%. Okay, so the question was an extract question. There's something about the Cratchit family. And then the question says, explore how Dickens uses the Cratchit family to show the struggles of the poor. Now, explore means have more than one idea. Well, guess what? If you begin with a three-part thesis, you're straight away saying to the examiner, I have more than one idea. Please give me some decent marks. So this is what Lissy has put as her opening sentence. Dickens presents the Cratchits as a relatable and morally good family. So that's one and a half ideas at least there. But then she's done the next thing which is vital. She said, well, why bother? Why is Dickens bothered to do that? Well, it's to evoke sympathy from the reader. It would be even better if um, she then supposed what Dickens wanted the reader to do, you know, having felt sympathetic, what behaviour would the reader change? Um, and also, the third point, to highlight the struggles of the poor, and therefore, how would the reader change their attitude to the poor? So that would have made the thesis even better. It would have been a four-part thesis. Now, if we look at the very first thing the examiner is looking for, there's that word exploratory again, and the examiner wants a well-structured argument. Now, you can see that Lissy has put three things that she wants to prove in the essay, and that forces her to have a well-structured argument. It wants a conceptualised approach. Now, conceptualised just means it's organised round a big idea, and the big idea that Lissy has chosen for herself is the creation of sympathy for the struggles of the poor. So, automatically, that three-part thesis hits the first two of our seven criteria. Let's have a look at the first two paragraphs. Dickens presents the Cratchits as a seemingly content and joyful family through the use of a semantic field of religion. Stave 3 shows the Christmas celebrations with proposals of God bless us and complaints deemed heresy. This constant use of religious imagery would resonate with a Victorian audience, many of whom were devout Christians, and as such would immediately recognise the Cratchits as a morally good family. Now the vocabulary I've highlighted in yellow are the sorts of words that students of English literature have to use in order to write about literature. So whatever essay you're writing on whatever topic and whatever novel or play or whatever, these words resonate, religious imagery, audience, semantic field, seemingly, these are all words you would use to write about literature. Now, that's what the examiner means when they're talking about judicious use of subject terminology. Judicious means you only use it when it's needed and also you use it in an exact way. Subject terminology isn't all this stuff about verbs and nouns and adverbs because it doesn't add anything to our understanding of what the writer's up to. But here we do have an understanding. We know that there's lots of deliberate word choice, hence the semantic field. We know that the religious imagery is there to have an effect on a Victorian audience who are going to identify, that's what resonate means, are going to identify with the people in the passage. So that is what judicious subject terminology means. Now the other stuff that I have in bold is how Lizzie uses context 
So she talks about a Victorian audience and she says they would immediately recognise the Cratchits in this Christian way as a morally good family. So what happens here is that the context works within the sentence. There isn't a separate paragraph for context. So contextual factors appears in point seven and that's what exploration means. These bits of context are put inside a sentence where, the, where you, the student, are exploring an interpretation. And here, Lizzie's arguing that he deliberately uses Christian language in order to tap into the Christian morality of the readers so that they will see it's their moral duty to help the poor. Hopefully, that makes complete sense to you. So, in her next paragraph, I've only highlighted furthermore because I want you to get an impression of how her paragraphs are linked. Why is it so important to link paragraphs? Well, if you can take one paragraph and put it somewhere else in the essay, you haven't coherently linked your argument together. So, the furthermore has to link back to this idea of morality and Christianity, otherwise it won't fit. So let's see if Lissy manages to get it right. By highlighting an insult towards Mrs Cratchit as heresy, a crime against the church and by extension God, Dickens shows the closeness and joy in the Cratchit family. So she has, hasn't she? Heresy and church both refer back to the Christianity that she was talking about earlier. So using those connectives at the beginning of the paragraphs forces her to have a well-structured argument. And it's a really easy trick for you to learn. We'll see it in the next paragraph as well with, however, another connective to link her paragraphs together in a sequence that forms an argument. OK, well, I also want to train you how to get 100%. And so what I've said here is that Lissy needs a bit more to link this joy uh, back to Christian morality and why Dickens shows this. Why does he show this feeling of joy in this Christian family who are nevertheless poor? Now, Lissy doesn't have to make up a reason. She simply goes back to her thesis and will go back to the point she made here and show how that increases our sympathy, um, so the reader's sympathy towards the Cratchits. You know, we're more sympathetic towards them because they manage to remain joyful, even in the worst of circumstances where we can see that they're nearly starving. And this is important because it portrays them as the deserving poor. It was really common in Victorian times to see the poor as somehow deserving to be poor. If they had any intelligence or if they worked harder, they wouldn't be poor. That was the myth that many of Dickens' readers would have held to, and Dickens wants to dispel that myth. He wants to say they don't deserve to be poor, they do work hard, but society is loaded against them. So being explicit about that would have helped Lissy to get 100%. Now Lissy does something quite advanced. She's talked about a kind of Christian reading of the scene. Now she's going to look at a Marxist, communist reading of the scene. However, Marxist critics would argue that religion is a construct made for the purpose of keeping the working class in order. And by highlighting the Cratchit family as a religious one, Dickens is in fact showing their lack of control and the oppression of the upper class. So she hasn't fully explained that idea, but what she means is they are controlled by their religion because religion encourages them to accept the social position that they're in. Now, a Marxist critic would say, therefore, that religion is holding them back. Religion is just another instrument of society that's forcing them to accept their, poli uh, their poverty rather than rebelling. Now, she's presented the Marxist criticism and is now going to point out that Dickens wouldn't have agreed with that because he wasn't a Marxist, he was a Christian. So, however, as Dickens himself was Christian and was appealing to a predominantly Christian audience, there's that context put in like an embedded quotation look. It is more likely that he is instead showing the Cratchits in a positive light through the use of religious imagery. So that was pretty good. It's taken her easily into the top of the mark scheme. Uh, but she sort of cheated a little bit 
So this argument, the Marxist one, is called an Aunt Sally. And that's a term we use when you introduce an argument simply to dismiss it as wrong. You know, so saying, yes, it, we could look at it from a Marxist point of view, but actually we can't because Dickens was a Christian. That's a little bit of a cheat. So here's how she could have used both in a more sophisticated way. A better argument would be that Dickens is campaigning for help for the poor, but is not criticising the capitalist system which exploits the workers. So he's not criticising the system that makes them poor, um, only the system that doesn't give them charity. A society which rejected Christianity and the promise of heaven might work much, ha much higher, that should be harder, to achieve equality and eradicate poverty now, urgently. So what I'm saying in this bit is that Lissy could have argued for a Marxist interpretation, and that would criticise Dickens for not protesting even more strongly about the causes of poverty in the novel as he presents it, the society as he presents it in the novel. Now, the reason that's a good idea is that the contextual factors that are in the Marx scheme aren't just the context of the time the novel was written. Contextual factors also refers to our own context. How do we, as a modern, modern audience, interpret this version of history presented in the literature? So you can, if you choose, be quite critical of Dickens for not being strident enough, forceful enough, in trying to get society to change the causes of poverty in the first place. Here's the next paragraph. It could be argued that Dickens shows the struggles of the poor through the use of tone in the presentation of the Cratchits. Dickens interweaves a joyful description with hints at poverty and loss to create an uncertain and somewhat melancholy tone. By commenting that nobody said or thought it was at all a small pudding for a large family, Dickens highlights how small the pudding actually is. So this concentration on tone is a really good use of subject terminology again, and it links to the idea of how Dickens is trying to persuade the audience again about the struggles of the poor. Notice how she keeps going back to the ideas that were in her thesis. Furthermore, the fun, final rather drawn-out sentence, Bob held his withered little hand, dreaded that he might be taken from him, entirely changes the tone of the paragraph. So she's writing about tone again, and that shows that it links back to the previous paragraph. The verb taken shows the lack of control that the Cratchits, and by extension the poor, have over their lives, and also foreshadows stay for where Tiny Tim is taken from them. So there's a lot of sophisticated stuff going on here. The idea of loss of control appeared earlier, so she's developing that argument again. But now when she starts talking about foreshadowing future events, this is a brilliant way to link to other parts of the novel away from the extract. But it's also a way that she can show she's writing about the form and structure of the novel. Foreshadowing is a structural feature. Another one that I keep telling my students to use is contrast. When you start looking at how the novel is put together in that way, you're writing about structure. And the other way she's writing about structure is looking at the final line of the extract. So she's zooming in and looking at the structure of that as well, saying why this final line is so important in changing our perception of the family. She carries that on in the next paragraph. Moreover, the drawn-out nature of the sentence emphasises Cratchit's love for his son and could show how he's trying to make the most of the time they have together. This strong connection is emphasised further, so this is what exploratory means, coming up with more than one interpretation for the same thing, in stay four, again that structural feature looking at later in the novel, where the usually chaotic and noisy Cratchit household is described as quiet, very quiet. This juxtaposition shows the grief that the Cratchits feel and highlights the struggles of the poor in Victorian England. And that word juxtaposition is exactly what contrast means, and you can see how she's 
inserting these ideas about the structure of the novel and then relating it to the purpose that was in her thesis, remember, to highlight the struggles of the poor. And that's what makes this such a successful essay. The argument is all linked together, keeps going back to the thesis, and it covers all those seven points in the marking criteria. Dickens shows the struggles of the Cratchits, and by extension the poor, to show the wrongs in beliefs, such as Malthusian theory. To do this, Scrooge embodies Malthusian ideas. Malthusian ideas state that the poor should not be helped, as otherwise, and Scrooge even directly quotes this, there will be a surplus population. By presenting and building up the Cratchit's grief, Dickens evokes sympathy from the reader and shows the immoral views of Malthusian theory. So this is probably her very best paragraph because it shows this interpretation, a critical interpretation, linked to the context, linked to an embedded quotation, and linked back again to why Dickens is doing it, evoking sympathy, which you remember was in the thesis. Now, if we go back to point one, you'll notice that you want to have a critical and exploratory argument. Now, to be critical, you just have to make a judgment. But how easy is that when you take um, a critical point of view from the past? So, like Malthus here, and Marx before, the Marxist and the Malthusian. As soon as you start doing that, you force the examiner to say yes, you're using a critical viewpoint in your writing. To conclude, Dickens presents the Cratchits in a positive light and a negative tone to evoke sympathy from the reader and highlight the struggles of the poor in Victorian England. So there's the conclusion. It refers back to the thesis, evocating sympathy, uh, sorry, evoking sympathy, but it doesn't really add anything new. So your conclusion shouldn't really repeat what the essay has already argued. Instead, it should always look at the ending of the text. All conclusions should do that, no matter whether it's a play or a poem or a novel. And see how that influences the reader. So in this case, why does Dickens choose not to make Scrooge visit the Cratchits with, with the turkey? That should say, his turkey, the one he's bought, sorry. So why doesn't he do that? Why does it focus on him and his future rather than his workforce and Bob? You know, if he's on the side of the poor, why does he end up still focusing on Scrooge? Do we as readers wish that he, Dickens, had a more socialist or Marxist outlook? Now, I only raise that because Lissy has looked at the Marxist interpretation in her essay. You don't have to do that, but it would fit this essay. Or... Are we happy with the status quo? Now, the status quo here, of course, isn't Scrooge. He has changed dramatically. The status quo are the social conditions that put people in poverty in the first place in Victorian England. OK, so another way to summarise that is that your conclusion needs to look at the ending of the text and then it also needs to look outwards towards society. And if you do that, you can get 100%. Yep, Lizzie wouldn't have been able to get 100% in 507 words, but she's got a grade 8 this way. It's a very good bit of writing, isn't it? But she could certainly have done this in another 50 to 100 words and got 100% in her answer. So let's go back to our seven skills. The one that we haven't really focused on much is this, a fine-grained and insightful analysis of language. Well, every time she's used a quotation that fits into a sentence, she's actually being fine-grained. These embedded quotations help her write about her ideas, her concepts, the Malthusian, the Marxist, the Christian. And those three things are all fine-grained analysis of the language that she quotes. Now, if you'd like me to do the same with your essay, please post it below. And I'm also looking for volunteers to post me essays that I can write up in a book. So Lissy's essay here, for example, I will put into a book. Thank you very much, Lissy, for giving me your permission to do that so that I can teach students from it and you'll soon be able to buy it on Amazon. Hurrah! Or take really good notes um, from this video and it's free. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for watching. Good luck with your revision. 
See you soon on my channel.